Hello, my name is Joel Brum. I'm a public information officer with the Bedrock and Salmon Fires. Welcome to our 6 p.m. virtual community meeting. Tonight, we'll be hearing from our agency administrators, fire operations, incident, excuse me, incident meteorologist, air resources advisor, and also, pardon, incident commander. Thank you. Darren? <laughs> Let me save you there, Joel. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Darren Cross. I'm your agency administrator for the Forest Service, and I'm also representing the ODF and, and their agency administrator, Mike uh, Caffaretta. Uh, so I almost got that. Uh, so thank you for, for attending tonight. It's really important that uh, you all hear this information straight from us, and we'll get you the best information we can. We have a good lineup of folks from operations and, and smoke and meteorology, and our RIC are going to address you guys and, and give you a lot of good information. First of all, I want to address that uh, or acknowledge uh, what the communities have been through over the last few years, whether you're on the McKenzie Riverside and watching uh, the Bedrock Fire or whether you're uh, in Oak Ridge and have the Salmon Fire in your backyard and have had the Holiday Farm and Cedar Creek Fires come so close to your communities. Um, it's really, uh, this is part of living with fire in, in 2023 and beyond. So you really want to acknowledge what, what you all are going through and let you know that we're doing our best to put these fires out as quickly as possible with the resources we have, which is a lot. We have been one of the top fires in the region in, in the Pacific Northwest for getting resources. We're up to 1,200 firefighters and nine helicopters. That's a lot of people that we have out on the ground doing that work to put these fires out as quickly as possible. Uh, I want to recognize our public information officers that are working really hard to, to answer all of your questions online uh, to make sure that the best information is out there for you uh, at all times. Um, I think uh, this, these, it's hard to go through these, these times, right? And I just, I just I hope you guys understand that, that it's, we're doing our best and, and we're working really hard to put these fires out with our partners and with the resources that we have. You'll get some more information from our operations to tell you exactly what's happening out there. And, and you may even see or have seen some, some more smoke in the air recently as uh, these fires, as we've been working on, on uh, burnout operations or, or um, firing operations to, to clean up those fuels and, and really put these fires to bed as fast as we can. So uh, hopefully you'll, you'll understand uh, the information and ask questions. I encourage you to ask questions in the chat. We have people right here uh, waiting uh, for your questions and, and we'll answer those as best we can. So thanks. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Aaron Rowe. I'm the, one of the operations section chiefs with Team 12 who's been assigned to both the Bedrock and the Salmon Fire. So I'm going to start with a success story on how we went direct on the Salmon Fire. And so the Salmon Fire is just about three miles uh, east of Oak Ridge there. And right now uh, they're basically completed uh, on a burnout on the east side of, of uh, the fire there. And... Uh, we so they that basically this east side uh going up drainage is is basically getting locked in as we speak and uh on the west side uh we had hand line in there that's been there for two days now and uh we're very direct on the fire and we're, we're basically all the way around it so uh we're not going to call it contained yet but we we're very close to uh we're going to have to still mop it up and those kind of things but for all intensive purposes, the Salmon Creek fire is looking very good at this moment in time. Um, so pretty, pretty stoked that we uh, were able to do that. Uh, that's a new thing as of uh, basically right now. So, um, so kudos to the guys on the ground and gals on the ground with that. Uh, one other thing that's going on as a, uh, as an additional measure, uh, because uh, we, we did almost have this caught the other day. However, there was some, uh, some uh we call it rollout it uh could have been a log or a branch or an ember uh, basically rolled downhill and got outside of our containment lines overnight so uh, we kind of had to go to a plan b and so there's the uh, 209 road that's on the bottom of it now that we've uh, kind of opened up just a little bit and uh, has used that as our bottom containment line now and uh, so it's, it's, it's basically the bottom edge as the 209 road on it. And then uh, we had to have some hotshot crews uh, basically go up the uh, 
east flank there and tie it all together. So they'll be busy uh, mopping it up with hose lays that uh, I think the one is in on the west side, and then there's going to be uh, one in here soon on the east side. So that's gonna that wraps up um, what I'm going to talk about for the salmon fire. Um, and so that was a good success. Uh, there is some very successful things going on on the bedrock fire, uh, but I know that uh, there, there probably will be some smoke in the air for a little bit, and uh, a lot of that is due to the uh, terrain and in inaccessibility uh, due to just basically where the fire is. So what that means, uh, an, uh, we're using some a, a mix of strategies out here and a lot of it is direct uh this is a direct strategy that's working right now that's um we're we're gonna you know as as we uh, get lo a longer duration into the fire uh we'll start to increase our containment and there's some areas like here and like here that are looking really good right now and we'll be able to start in increasing our containment numbers because we are on that direct edge now uh where it's a little bit tougher is in this in this area here that was in the old Jones fire and uh, in this area here that was in the I think it was the Middle Fork fire and so those areas uh, we have to we have to burn off of an indirect line which is basically in this case it's the uh, 1817 road uh, and that is uh, near Little Cowhorn Mountain and as we speak uh, we're uh, very soon um, we're gonna try to start burning uh, basically along the road all the way down, not all tonight, but uh, we're gonna basically take little chunks of it and move westbound. Um, and as we do that, um, we're gonna have, uh, you know, in consecutive days later, we're gonna have to burn out all this stuff on the inside, but, but what we do is basically burn, burn westbound on the road. And in this case, there's a lot of direct hand line that's here and they're, they're connecting little road segments and hand line segments as as we go around the fire so um basically a, a lot of uh a lot of this burning is going to start here fairly soon uh uh really tonight is uh when we're going to get at it in earnest um, we've been doing little chunks here and there and you may have seen uh, some smoke the last couple days but it's it's probably going to get a little bit more smoky here in a little bit and you'll hear from our air resource advisor here soon on what that looks like but uh, overall really good progress we're j it's just going to take some time and um, and so appreciate your patience on all that and um, but overall fire is looking really good we're getting the resources uh, we need to do this kind of work um, we've got all kinds of hotshot crews here lots of uh, helicopters uh, with uh, that we can put water in buckets and uh, and help the firefighters on the ground with those efforts and um, and really overall there, there's a couple different things going on i could really get into some detail but i'm going to try to stay fairly high level and and i think that i'm going to stop right there and here's some weather thank you hello everyone i'm rebecca muesley the incident meteorologist on the fire a little bit about what i do because you might think it's a little strange that there be a weather forecaster on a fire my job is to provide localized weather, water, and climate information, both for the protection of our firefighters and for operation success. So I wanted to start off a little bit painting a picture of what has happened thus far this year. So this graph here shows our precipitation departure from normal, meaning the amount of precipitation in comparison to what we normally see for the water year, which starts in October, so October through now. And I've highlighted here in uh, Lane County the area in which we're in, and you'll see that we are almost 10 inches below normal for precipitation which is very, very dry. And as we stand, we are currently in a moderate drought. So now as we look forward, we're probably wondering where is the rain? And if I can have the next slide, please. Unfortunately, for the next month, it does not look like we're going to see a significant amount of rain. This is a graphic from the Climate Prediction Center, and it looks at the average, or the, sorry, excuse me, the monthly precipitation outlook, which is the average precipitation over the next month.
And you'll see here that almost all of Oregon is white, which means that there's equal chances that we'll see above normal and below normal precipitation. But note here that the average mean precipitation is only one hundredth of an inch, meaning we have equal chances of seeing above that and below that. But based off of the pattern that I'm seeing right now, it looks like we're going to be rain free at least for the next week. Temperature, we are going to heat up. You may have seen on the news that we might be seeing a heat wave. Well, I'm here to kind of squash that a little bit, at least for our fire, things are not going to be nearly as hot. So we are looking though above normal for temperatures, especially in Northwest Oregon and Western Washington. But where we are here at the Bedrock Fire, we only are at about a, a 40 to 50% chance of be seeing above normal temperatures for the average of the month. And this is for the mean temperature, meaning if you were to average the high and the low. Now our average mean temperature for the month of August is 68.3 degrees and our average high temperature is 98 degrees. Now again, while we may not be seeing those high temperatures here on our fire, you might be seeing them where you are looking right now. Next slide, please. So speaking of temperatures, this is what we saw today. It was quite a warm day. We had clear skies and we have high pressure starting to build in. And as is common with high pressure, we see those warming and drying conditions, especially during the summer. So today on the fire, we saw temperatures ranging from 73 degrees at about 4,000 feet in elevation, all the way to 87 degrees at about 1,000 feet of elevation there in the valley. So you can see that there's quite a range of temperatures throughout uh, the fire area. And then our minimum humidity. So humidity is important because it affects fuel dryness, but it also can um, exacerbate some of the atmospheric conditions in the area. So humidity for us today, we reached as low as 24% in the lower elevations and almost 40% up aloft. So what am I looking at for the next week? That high pressure ridge is going to continue to build and that's going to intensify through the weekend. And as we see that intensify, temperatures will rise and we will see drops in humidity. Now those combinations of the two can impact our fire and that relates into that thermal belt, which I know we've had a few questions about. So a thermal belt sits in a valley. So I want you to picture with me a valley. And the thermal belt is a strip right in the middle of warm air that's very, very dry. So there's cooler air below it that's a little bit moist and moist air above that spot. So it really is a belt that sits right in the valley. Now, when we see those relative humidity and temperatures that are a little bit higher temps, lower relative humidity, that's where we see kind of an engagement of fire behavior. And while I'm not a fire, um, behavior analyst, I do know that we can see a little bit more activity there. So as we move through the week, we'll see that high pressure, temperatures will rise, relative humidity will drop. Now we will see a little bit of an increase in wind, but we are looking at a northwesterly wind, so an onshore wind. Now we'll see some kind of breezier conditions, especially along the ridges and maybe through the valleys, but generally when we get that northwesterly wind, it is a little bit more moist. So that is definitely a positive. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that pop up, but just remember, you know, we're here for firefighter safety and we work alongside our weather service offices to provide uh, that weather information for our communities. Evening, Jason Prentice, Air Resource Advisor assigned here to the Bedrock Fire. Uh, my role here with the fire is to, well, one of them is to make sure that uh, the public has information related to smoke from the fire and how it will impact your air quality uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one of the best links we have to share with you is fire.airnow.gov. You can go to this site. It will show you all the air quality sensors that are around, uh, both that the state puts out, that we at the fire put out, as well as some sensors that you guys as citizens have out there at your homes and businesses. Um, this site will provide you with things like a graph of air quality over the past week and give you tips on actions that you can take uh, depending upon if air quality is moderate, unhealthy for sensitive groups, or even unhealthy for everyone out there. Um, so next slide. Um, so daily here at the fire we're producing smoke outlooks. 
Uh, they're provided not only on that fire.airnow.gov, uh, but also provided by the public information office here at the fire. Uh, they will have expected air quality index values for today and tomorrow, as well as a look out further into the future. Um, we are taking into account both the bedrock and the salmon fires, as well as considering uh, Lookout and Wiley fires that are further to the north and their impacts that they could have on this area uh, in regards to smoke. Um, thankfully, we've been in a pattern uh, with the weather conditions. We have primarily seen good to moderate air quality conditions overall. However, we do see brief moments where we reach unhealthy for sensitive groups or unhealthy for all. Uh, when we do see those and you can you know, see and smell those impacts, uh, you know, we encourage you to take steps to uh, keep yourself safe, whether that's going indoors, finding a spot that does have good air quality, um, and, and in there. And we do have a list of actions uh, to protect yourself here, including the outlook. Um, don't expect much change uh, with the incoming weather. Uh, we are considering operations and when they are putting additional smoke into the air. Um, so we do expect primarily good to moderate conditions for most, uh, but we may see maybe a slight increase in those periods of, of unhealthy for sensitive groups and unhealthy overall. Um, but again, have any additional questions, we can be sure to answer before this meeting's over. Thanks. Good evening, I'm Jeff Dimke, the incident commander for Northwest Team 12. And so, you know, we talked about the weather, the fire, the activities here, and I'm gonna and try to answer a couple of questions that were handed to me, but also go over some of the actions that were going, that are, were taking place. So like on bedrock, you're, we're gonna see some increased smoke and activity up here, because it's gonna take us some time uh, to get around this fire. And we're doing very small firing operations to start burning out our containment lines with uh, a whole bunch of resources. And we have staffing for those resources. We're actually running three different shifts right now. We have a day shift, a night shift, and a swing shift. And they're adjusting to our schedule and our operations to meet the needs. And so you will start seeing some small increase in activity and smoke during the day or in the evening when we have those opportunities to burn those, those chunks of line to secure them on our schedule. And so when we have the right environment and we can contain the fire, we're gonna slowly and with effort, go ahead and start, we're going, we have already been doing this, as you'll see some activity on the ridge lines up here on these road systems where we like to stick um, on places where we, we, that it's easy to catch fire, which is river, ridges, and roads. And, and also we're going direct to minimize some of the smoke. So we're taking multiple actions trying to catch this or suppressing this fire. Uh, the actions we're taking are based off the terrain and the hazards and the mitigations that we have in place and trying to re reduce fit risk to firefighters and also you as the public. So our number one priority is firefighter and public safety that we're here on behalf of the agencies and also you as the public. Um, we're here, we're suppressing this fire and we're trying to put it out as quickly and as small as possible. And sometimes that small as possible includes these burnout and these other options. The opposite's going on over here. We showed up, we, we were not assigned this fire. It, it started literally the day we, we were assuming command and we took this fire um, in conjunction with the agencies and, and sent resources. Even though it wasn't ours, we sent stuff to help out. Uh, recognize that a new start is the highest priority and we need to catch it while it's small. Uh, in the end, we ended up assuming command of this because it made sense. We were already here, we had resources, we sent stuff to help. And we went direct, recognizing the values at risk and where we are here and where we are at um, located to the community of Oak Ridge and High Prairie. That direct attack was successful. Um, we recognize there is risk, but we also recognize the values there. And so a lot of effort and a lot of people put, put themselves at risk to do this. And we've been very successful. We're, we're at about a little over 100 acres on that fire. Um, the containment date was brought up on this uh, in, the, in the log. Um, in this fuel type in the west side of Oregon, things don't just go out. It takes a whole lot of horsepower and a whole lot of heartbeats to go out there and put these to bed. So you probably will see people out here for about the next month checking this, mopping it up. We will have a large presence here, our, our entire, entire duration here, which is the next two weeks. Um, so there's gonna be traffic, there's gonna be people out here on this fire, we still have aviation. It is going to take a while to put that out. Uh, or, or call, call it contained. Also, you heard operations talk about, we have line around this. The reason we're still showing 0% is we don't like to show per high percentage containment when we don't, we don't know we have it. 
we like to make sure if we're going to put 5, 10, 50 percent, that that's not going to change. So you're going to see us slowly increase these numbers, even though we have line all the way around this. We're not going to put you're not going to see us move this to 100 percent here in the next couple of days. It's going to slowly climb up. The rationale behind that is there's still fire in here. There's still rollout. There's still activity. It's not just going to go stop smoking and be out. This thing could probably this thing could smoke for weeks and months on end at the smaller scale. And we can only work in this area after we've mitigated hazards. And that's going to take time to do. Um, the, over here on Bedrock, remember which fire I'm talking about now. Um, you know, we the previous team left us with the outstanding package. They had done some great planning and coordination and communication with the public and the agencies. Uh, a direct approach was used here. We're, we're continuing with direct here, and we figured out a couple spots to, to go direct and try to de decrease smoke and exposure to firefighters. It, but we can't do that on the whole fire. And so that's why we're moving into that indirect action in, in those firing operations, because that's the best place to be where we have the highest probability of success with the lowest impact to fire or lowest risk um, to firefighters without getting anybody hurt or killed. And that's our main focus, right? We want to keep this fire small. We want to get back to our, we have lives, we have homes. We want to get back to those. But for us to be successful, we have to take those actions. And that's how we mitigate hazards and we make fires as small as possible. Um, I think I answered the closure question. There's one is about, will we lift the closure on this when the fire is contained? Yes, it actually might be lifted before the fire is actually fully contained and activity in that area is decreased. Um, I answer the one about the containment date. It just takes a really long time to put these fires out. Um, sometimes it's mother nature in winter and you'll still see smokes the next year. For example, cedar popped a smoke in it, which was a holdover from out in the middle of the black from last year. Um, that's been a year, right? So mother nature has a play in this and it also helps us be successful. Any other questions? I have a couple thoughts and potentially go backs to Darren Cross, agency administrator. Uh, there's a lot of questions about evacuations and just want to be clear that Lane County is responsible for any evacuations that are happening. Uh, there is a tool we, we uh, encourage you to go to uh, Lane County evacuations on the web. There's a tool on there where you can put in your address and actually measure the tool for, for how far the fire is from your house. So uh, again, Lane County is responsible for that. So Lane County uh, website is the best place to go for, for that information. And with closure orders, uh, the closure orders are in place for your safety and the safety of our firefighters. So please, we ask you to respect those closures. We understand there's places that you want to go, and we're going to open those as soon as we can, as soon as it's safe. All right, I'm going to attempt to answer, I think, th three or maybe four questions here. So uh, let's see, first one I got is... Uh, I don't. I, I think the question is when should be re, when should be be ready for level one evacuations. I think is the question. Yeah, and so uh, Darren's whispering to me always. You should always be ready to go for that. Um, so um, I guess the way I'd say that it is you should always be ready to go for that. Uh, r really, to w when we get to those level one evacuations. There's a acronym, or not, it's not an acronym, but uh, I think a three-step thing that is done here in Oregon called Ready, Set, Go, if I'm not mistaken. So obviously you need to be ready to do that, and that would be packing up belongings, those kind of things, but that's not in, in the ready part to be ready to go. Uh, set might be to load your car up, those kind of things. And lastly, go when that level three gets there to go. So uh, right now we're, we're in a pretty good spot. I, uh, I'll just briefly say on the map here, um, you know, all these actions were taken up here very proactive to try to corral it from going further north uh, into, into the old holiday farm fire as well as uh, a lot of the private land that's to the north there. Uh, there are some communities up to the north there, but those are still quite a ways away. And uh, there's for anyone that's seen what's what the landscape looks like just north of where we are it it's 
it's pretty severe what happened in the holiday farm. So I, I don't think there's a real, it could happen, but there's pretty uh, low chances of it, of it moving around much more in here because they've done some planting of trees and those kind of proactive efforts, but they're very small trees right now. And, and uh, so I, I think this is a, we don't want it to go this way by any means, but there's a lot of ways it's going to have to go to get into our communities. Um, hopefully that answered that question. Um, next question I had was, uh, let's see, are you worried about it getting into the prior burned area? And that's, I roughly just answered that. So I think we're taking some really proactive steps on what we're doing to burn this uh, top edge up here. Um, so I guess I, I'm not worried about that because I think we're doing all the right things at the right time. And so, um, you know, things could change, but I'm feeling pretty good about our actions that we're taking right now and, and moving forward in, in a good way. Uh, so I'll say that I answered that one. Um, Jeff answered, when will bedrock be fully contained? And it, it's going to take a while. So um, it's, it, there's a lot of work still ahead of us. Um, next question, will there be more retardant drops? I'm not going to guarantee that there's going to be more retardant drops, but um, retardant drops can be used for a couple different things. One would be a proactive thing. So as we burn down these sides of this, we might put retardant on the backside of it to not have a further start over here. Um, and kind of, we, we'd call that like a pre-treatment. So we might put retardant on purpose there to keep it out of, of what's on, on the, call it the north side of the road. Um, while we do want to burn this side of it. So um, there's some subtleties there, obviously, but, uh, you know, so, but, but that, that's, that's more of a proactive treatment. We could do a reactive treatment too. If it does cross that road, you might see retardant trying to uh, put it out over there too. So there, there's a couple different ways that we could use retardant. So um, retardant's one of our tools we'd use. So uh, hopefully that answered the questions. Those are the four questions I've got at this moment. Okay, um, just as a reminder, uh, if you are a Lane County resident, you can sign up for emergency alerts at lanealerts.org. That way, if there are evacuation changes in your home area, you'll get those sent to your cell phone. Also wanna let people know that there will be an in-person community meeting tomorrow night at 6 p.m. in the community of Oak Ridge at the Oak Ridge High School in the auditorium. And uh, we'll be here, it'll be a similar presentation to tonight, but you'll be able to uh, talk to us and ask questions in person. Uh, so with that, thank you all and have a good night.